The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. So we're all old enough to remember the saga of GameStop and Reddit when a crew of retail investors on Reddit Wall Street Bets supposedly um, had a big triumph over the big bad guys of hedge, of hedge funds. So basically the narrative is, is that this group of retail investors basically triumphs by forcing a short squeeze and causing big hedge funds to lose money. Um, our next guest, Spencer Jacob, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, has a new book out that argues that that narrative is fundamentally flawed. His new book is called The Revolution That Wasn't, GameStop, Reddit, and the Fleecing of Small Investors. So welcome, Spencer. Hey, thanks for having me. So um, I had the pleasure of reading your book this weekend. It's a really fascinating read. Um, and I would just love for you, for the people who have not had a chance to read it yet, to just break down your central thesis here. You're basically saying that this is not how the media portrayed it. It was not a triumph of retail investors. Actually, Wall Street kind of had the last laugh. Um, can you just explain you know, what you mean by that and what evidence you have to support it? Sure. Well, I put it in historical context because you know Wall Street is more than two years old, right? Wall Street, or let's say stock markets, are are centuries old, and uh, there have been lots of episodes of people getting excited uh, individually or as a group and thinking that they could beat the man, that they could beat the street, that they could beat the house, and plowing a lot of fresh money into the markets, you know, and entering it and um, and then leaving disappointed. And this is just one more of those. The the basic thesis was in saying that it's a revolution is that it was a twofer, that you had a bunch of people who wanted to make a lot of money and also wanted to give Wall Street a black eye in the process. And of course, the headlines at the time certainly made it sound like that. You know, you had hedge funds losing billions of dollars. And so you had some individual players on Wall Street who had a very bad week, a very bad month. And that's undeniable. But what really happened is that Wall Street made a ton of money in the lead up to the, the squeeze and in the aftermath of the squeeze just because of the sheer level of activity. And as a group, uh, a lot of these meme stock traders got in very high and either are still holding or got out or are embittered and uh, have these theories that they need to have diamond hands and that there's, it's just going to come next week, next month, there's going to be a big squeeze and they just need to, to be in there based on really no, no solid evidence at all. So Spencer, that makes a lot of sense. And I think your book actually details quite nicely um, how like there was a lot of profit on Wall Street, despite this narrative that Wall Street, you know, collectively got a black eye. But I'm just curious, you know, on the retail investor side, what evidence do we have that a lot of retail investors were actually hurt by this, right? Because that, that to me was the central narrative, that this was like the triumph of the little guy, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. do we have stories or, or, or evidence that a lot of retail investors really lost a lot of money in, in the whole GameStop so-called revolution? Well, we have tons of anecdotes. Let's not forget that GameStop, even today, and AMC and the other meme stocks are still elevated relative to where they, they were before. So there's still some air to come out of them. Uh, also, those companies have gone out, a couple of them, and raised in excess of a billion dollars from their new enthusiastic shareholders. And so it, it's all a bit of a jumble and difficult to disentangle. I mean, AMC went out and raised over $1 billion, even as its executives sold personally over $90 million in their own shares. Uh, how, do you, how do you disentangle who won, who lost? If you're just looking at something like Reddit or TikTok or whatever, and you hear people talking about it, the people who, who made money are going to be, in, in any of these cases, in any kind of mania, whether it's dot coms or whatever, yeah, 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 I saw it and I got out, or uh, I got in at a really low price, you don't hear the people as much who say, yeah, I bought GameStop at $420, on Thursday, January 28th, and now I'm sitting on a 75% loss. So uh, th those, those people are, you know, are kind of licking their wounds and either sold or didn't sell. But if you look at just, it's just the amount of money pumped into options premium, as I explained in the book, options played a really big role in this. You, know, you had tens of billions of dollars in options premium in GameStop alone. I mean, if you look at the, the stocks uh, that saw a lot of uh, options turnover in the stock market last year, you know, you have these big companies like Apple and NVIDIA, and then GameStop is in there. I mean, what the heck? You know, GameStop is like a, t a tiny company. It was worth $230 million at the beginning of this saga. So it, it does not belong on that list at all. And, and tons of money was basically kind of squandered by investors trying to sustain a gamma squeeze in the stock. 
So, Spencer, welcome. I, you know, one of the, the this story isn't over yet, as you, as you point out, and mm-hmm. it, it's an ongoing saga. It turns out, though, that news just uh, last week that the feds paid a visit to Andrew Left, who comes off kind of sympathetically mm-hmm. in, in, in your book. Does that mm-hmm. change your view of uh, Andrew Left, of, of the Melvin Capital, et cetera? Mm-hmm. knowing that, okay, there, there seems to be some sort of uh, activity, at least from the feds, uh, investigating what they're up to, or there was back then, which could explain why mm-hmm. we stopped seeing those reports coming out of Citron, et cetera. Do you think that that, mm-hmm. um, does that change how, uh, how you view it now that that happened, that news came out after the book was uh, written? No, it doesn't. I have no idea why they paid him a visit. It could be related to GameStop. It could be related to any of the other hundreds of, of companies that uh, that he shorted. He also goes long stocks. Um, I, I really have no idea. I mean, the I, I do mention in my book. I mean, short sellers were sort of cast as the villain on on Reddit and elsewhere, and they they historically have been cast as villains. You can go back to the through the entire history of stock markets, going back to the the Dutch in the 1600s. And short selling was periodically banned because how dare these people bet that stocks that most of us hope will go up, that they'll go down. But short sellers play a a vital role. And especially for inexperienced retail investors, they play a very vital role because short sellers just generally, and I'm not talking about Andrew Left or casting him as a hero or casting Gabe Plotkin or Melvin Capital as a hero or any short seller for that matter, but short sellers you, you can there's there's two things if, if you're a long only investor that you can do with a stock you can buy it or you can not buy it uh, so you can vote for it or you can abstain and short sellers represent the only no vote the only vote that something is overpriced perhaps even fraudulent and is going to go down now if you're an inexperienced retail investor and this is a story of uh, in excess of 10 million mostly inexperienced retail investors who got into stock trading in the sort of year, year and a half before this episode, you need somebody to basically be able to bet against a stock to make the price more correct because you're not necessarily equipped to do all the forensic accounting and the valuation work and know if a stock is properly valued. If you don't have people out there who are, are willing to stick their necks out and be short, then it, you know then prices are gonna be more wrong and there is episode after episode of that happening. So. You know, whatever Andrew Left did or didn't do has has no bearing on the basic thesis of the book and uh, and the role of short sellers at all. Spencer, I wonder if you can weigh in on the parallels you see with cryptocurrencies and the whole digital Mm -hmm. economy Mm -hmm. and the consequences therein. And and if you could weigh in on, you know, Elon Musk, Mm -hmm. Doge as well, you know, on the one hand, they could be considered Mm -hmm. dangerous, but at the same time, great for mainstream adoption. Sure. Elon Musk plays, uh, ha- makes a couple of cameos in this. Uh, he he jumped in and kind of fired up the crowd at a, a critical point during the the heart of the meme stock squeeze. Um, and you know, you you had a, a few different millionaires and billionaires coming in, and you had a lot of financial influencers also playing a role in the meme stock squeeze. Some of them did it uh, to make money. Uh, in Elon Musk's case, I mean, he was the richest man in the world at the time. He didn't do it personally to make money. He did it really, I, I, I think, for, uh, for attention, because attention is the currency of social media, and he wants to be adored and came out there. How does it play into, uh, into cryptocurrency? I think if you look at these meme stocks that were valued in, in some cases, you know, they still were stocks, right? Stocks, you still can say, I think this company is worth this much, and its assets, and its intellectual property, and its future cash flows are worth this much, and then they were worth 10 or 20 or 100 times what uh, what analysts said they were worth, which is why all you know all the analysts sort of either gave up covering them or or had sales on them at the time. They couldn't they couldn't actually make an argument. Cryptocurrencies are a little bit different because it's very difficult to uh, to do a DCF model on Dogecoin or or whatever, right? Because there, it's not a company; it's uh, it's an asset, and so it's much more sort of an art than a science. But you did see a lot of the speculative uh, enthusiasm merge in the months after the the meme stock squeeze from meme stocks into things like Dogecoin. And if you look at Robinhood, which is a very big player in my story, Robinhood's profits went from being primarily driven by people buying shares and options and in meme stocks and other things. And going the the following quarter, they made uh, a, a lot more money in Dogecoin than on these meme stocks. So 
I think that if you drew a Venn diagram of people who were excited about meme stocks and Dogecoin and even people who profited from one or the other, there is a fair bit of overlap. And in that sense, there's a, there's a similarity. So just going back to your central thesis here, though, I mean, you know, it's hard not to read your book and see a lot of echoes of the crypto world, right? So like this whole idea behind right. GameStop or this whole narrative behind GameStop is you had all these little guys basically driving up a stock just because they believed in the stock. That was the main reason, right? It was kind of like a totally sentiment driven phenomenon, right? At least at that period. And well, then you switch over well, to Do Doge. Do Doge and Sheeb, you know, right. stuff like, uh, you know, coins like that, you have a similar narrative, right? That, you know, these are basically being driven by sentiment and that, you know, this is, they're, they're decentralized and they're just, it's like crowd, it, the crowd is driving up the price, right? And a lot of people are celebrating that and saying like, okay, well, somehow we feel excluded from the traditional market. So this is our chance mm -hmm. to kind of like get in on the ground floor and basically like along with my comrades drive up the price of an asset. Um, but you're saying that in the case of GameStop, that's actually not really what happened, right? That's just what it seemed like on the surface. Would you say that that applies to cryptocurrency as well? Or is, is, are the sort of like the big guys or the whales or the traditional finance, will they also get the last laugh when it comes to crypto as well? Sure, well, let me clarify. So they got into the, the meme stocks and GameStop specifically, not because they, they did a valuation and then there was some cerebral rational argument that no, GameStop is really worth $1,000 a share, not, uh, not $4 a share, right? There, nobody was really making like a, any kind of sound argument. What they were saying was that, you know, it, it was like, you know, we're all going to buy. You have all these these funds that are, are short and they correctly identified uh, a vulnerability on Wall Street. So there was like a, a lot of hubris on Wall Street where they had sold these stocks short to an extent where they had a, such a narrow exit that they were waiting to be ambushed and they weren't paying attention to what people were talking about on Reddit or on social media. And so they got completely blindsided when this crowd rushed in and, and they were completely blindsided by the, the strength of the crowd and the kind of the virality of the whole thing. And that, that's why they lost so much money and that's why the prices went up so much briefly. And yeah, and so there, I, I think you're right that there's um, some sense in the crypto world as in the meme stock world. And like I said, probably a lot of overlap uh, in terms of the personalities involved and certainly the demographics involved that this is our thing. Uh, we, uh, you know, there's kind of two sets of rules on wall street and we're being messed over and, uh, we don't really trust traditional finance. This is a generation primarily that, uh, their formative experiences, even though they might've been teenagers or children were during the great financial crisis and wall street's a crooked place. And we're going to, in the meme stock squeeze, they said, we're going to hurt wall street and make money in the process. And I guess in the crypto world, it's uh, this is our thing and Wall Street doesn't get it and we're going to get it on the ground floor and this is the future. So absolutely there, uh, I think you're right that, that there are parallels in the, the, the sentiment there. Uh, and there are also parallels, I uh, hate to, to be to rain on your parade, in the sense that there are other people who are just happy they showed up, right? Uh, you know, there are no commissions now for stocks, but we know now there are all these disclosures about how payment for order flow works that there are people making billions of dollars off of the kind of the support network of all these, these trades happening and all these options trades happening, right? So the people who really got rich off of this primarily were already on Wall Street and they were just middlemen. And the transaction costs in crypto, as you all know, are a lot higher. And uh, there are people who primarily act as middlemen. They're not risking their capital. They're out there basically facilitating the transactions and they're happy about the level of enthusiasm about crypto. And there are lots of new billionaires, people who weren't anywhere on the map five years ago who got rich, not because they owned crypto and took a risk, but because they facilitated all these transactions in crypto. I don't really see a big difference between those two. So you, you, you talked earlier about the ambushing of, of these uh, short sellers. It, it, it obviously, they didn't see the stimulus checks coming necessarily. Do you think that the stimulus checks ended up causing more economic damage than helping? I, you know, obviously individual stories, people needing that help. But do you think if, uh, from a macro 10,000 foot view, it caused more harm than good? And is, is that necessarily uh, something that needed to be reconsidered? Also, you, you, at, you end your book kind of positive on the individual investor. Does that apply to crypto? So two things. I, I, it's beyond the scope of my book to say whether uh, or not stimulus checks were good. I think they, they definitely came at a convenient time. You had a surge in the unemployment rate. You had this massive 
dislocation. And you didn't know back in March 2000 how long this pandemic would last. We, we could have been locked down for months and months, right? So the stimulus checks were, um, you know, not perfect. And landing in, in people's pockets who didn't necessarily need the cash, especially young people who had a lot of extra time on their hands, had seen their social lives kind of shrivel or disappear, uh, you know, they, that just poured fuel on the fire of all this, this opening of accounts. I think that's not disputable. Um, I do see um, a positive in the story in the sense that you had lots of, of people get on the, the ladder of Wall Street. Uh, I think there's three different outcomes there. I think some people are going to say, like, you know what, this was a little bit dumb, but now I have an account. Uh, I understand how to buy and sell a stock, and I'm going to sort of you know, take a much more longer term approach because you can't really build a, best, a nest egg in this country uh, unless you have your own business or something like that without investing in the stock market or the bond market or something like that. And so it's good that they have their feet on the ladder. I think so, a lot of those people are going to be bitter about their experience and still see Wall Street as crooked and they're just going to sort of try other stuff. And I guess some of those people are going to primarily play in arenas like crypto. Uh, I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell if crypto is, is going how much of an asset class it's going to be uh, in a year or five years or 10 years. And we're talking about decades here. Crypto wasn't anywhere 10 years ago. I don't know where it's going to be in 10 years or in 40 years when these people are, are nearing their retirement. You know, if you think that it's a great asset to invest in and that uh, and that it is an investment, that it's not a technology, but just something that you buy and and then hold and then sell, then that's fine. Then I guess they'll do OK. Um, I, I do a lot of reasons to to question that. I, I certainly wouldn't put a very large chunk personally of my nest egg into into cryptocurrency. I haven't put any, but I wouldn't. Even if I did, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't make an enormous bet on that. Just like I wouldn't make an enormous bet on any one technology in the stock market or any one stock. It's important to be diversified.